Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Bell, and I'm very, very excited to talk to you today about what we do at a Linda Mood Bell Learning Center. Many years ago, we had one learning center, and now oh, throughout the country and uh, internationally, we have approximately 100. Um, I've titled this A Linda Mood Bell Learning Center is a magical learning adventure. And here's why. The magic of learning is one of the most important and valuable gifts you will ever give or receive yourself. It is the foundation for all the things that we will be able to do in our lives. So, what's important to me today is that you understand that our philosophy is to get in and get out in a matter of a few weeks by what we call intensive intervention. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. This is usually done, I wish it was done more than just the summer, but usually uh, we see the most of our children, we see most of our children in the summer uh, when they're out of school. I wish that they would be coming throughout the school year, but there are all the um, restrictions that prevent parents from bringing their children in. Although now we have a private school called the Linda Mood Bell Academy that you can put your child in all year. But for the most part, most of our students come in the summer. And what I wrote down here was that we can be the best summer camp your child will ever attend. That's because in a matter of a few weeks, six or eight weeks, we can change that uh, child's learning profile. So here's how we started and what we do at a Linda Mood Bell Learning Center. I'm going to talk about, very quickly, a journey and what, how we went uh, for the last 31 years from instruction to research. And then I'm going to talk about the importance of a learning ability evaluation as step one. And then step two, differentiated instruction that we like to do uh, four hours a day, uh, every day for a matter of weeks, and then our goal is independence in learning. So here's Pat Lindemood and me. Um, I, I put on here a journey to know because it's been a long journey over these 31 years. We started um, with diagnostic testing and a, a focus on one area, and then we began to expand into another area, into another area of language processing. So for 31 years, from 1986 to 2018, we moved from instructional experience to scientific research. And this, this is how we started. We were sitting across from a child or an adult struggling to read a word or trying to comprehend a paragraph. And that provided us with a unique insight into the learning process. So Pat and I and the people that started with us never thought of us as uh, just teachers. We always thought of us as researchers trying to understand the learning process. What, what is it that I can do that that child or that adult can't do? We worked with thousands, literally thousands of individuals with all levels of language processing difficulty. And we began to ask these questions, like I just mentioned, why could some children easily learn to read from an early age and others not? Why do some children decode, that's Pat, um, well below their potential, unable to catch up despite years of special education, reading programs, and or private tutoring? What was not happening for them? Why do some individuals struggle to memorize sight words? Despite the fact that they'd been taught to sound out words, they still had difficulty memorizing words. Here was the, one of the most important ones for me, is why did some individuals read text easily yet not understand what they read? Why were other students analytical readers rather than global readers at the end of phonological instruction? An analytical reader sounds out many words as opposed to reading uh, quickly and, and easily with a, a well-established sight word base. We researched and we learned that's Phyllis Lindemood. 
and we learned that reading has component parts, and this is extremely important as we go through this process, that I explain this to you, that there are sensory cognitive functions that underlie the necessary component parts of reading. And I'll have a slide on this, but it's phonological awareness, symbol imagery, and concept imagery. So in 1986, I actually uh, created these. Oops. <clears throat> I created these circles. This one I called auditory because it was phonological processing and it is the ability to sound out a word you've not seen before. I've since learned that it is not just phonological awareness, it is also symbol imagery. And then the next component part that you have to have in order to be a good reader is word recognition or orthographic processing, and that is absolutely symbol imagery. And then you have to bring those two, the ability to sound out a word and the ability to recognize words, to global reading, which is contextual reading using your good vocabulary skills. Now, it would be fine if those are the only three component parts that you need for reading, but you can have individuals that can sound out words easily, can recognize words, and can read fast, yet they can't understand what they read because the only reason to read is comprehension. So that's the big circle that goes around those subsets. As we began to realize that, we authored instructional programs. And we learned that the sensory input, because the brain can only process information from the senses, the sensory input of imagery underlies both oral and written language processing. Here are the three sensory cognitive functions that I talked about earlier. It's phoneme awareness, the ability to perceive the identity number and sequence of sounds within words, and that's how Pat and I started uh, in 1986. That was all we needed to do. And then as we began to work with more and more students, we realized that there's an imagery component to phonological awareness, and there's an imagery component to comprehension. So this is symbol imagery, and it's the ability to create mental imagery for sounds and letters within words. Because we don't read and spell with just sounds, we have to convert those sounds to letters. And concept imagery is the exact opposite of symbol imagery. It is the ability to create an imaged gestalt or whole for oral and written language. So let's uh, get to those. We believe imagery is a primary sensory cognitive function. And we believe those are the foundation, those imagery skills are the foundation of uh, language processing. Um, let's talk more specifically about imagery. There are two types of imagery. As I mentioned before, symbol imagery. So if you're looking at this slide in concept imagery, and you can see that symbol imagery is uh, this, in this young man's ability to visualize the letters. And concept imagery is this young girl's ability to visualize concepts. And I think of it like this, that it's two types of imagery. It's parts and wholes. They're two separate, in my opinion, they're two separate types of imagery that we can do. You can be good at one and not so good at the other, or vice versa. Or you can be good at all of them, or both of them, or not good at either of them. So let's go a little bit more about, let's talk a little bit more about symbol imagery. Symbol imagery, I think of this, it's a phonological and orthographic image for decoding. It's the ability to image these sounds and letters and words. So if I show you that on the screen and then I take it away, you should be able to still conjure that image up. Like, what's the second letter that you saw? And if you can't, you probably have some weakness in symbol imagery and it's going to impact your ability to uh, spell orthographically. It'll impact your child's or a child or a student's ability to um, read and spell to their potential. Get it? So let's talk about this young man here. He actually is a student from a long time ago. And we're going to look at his profile in a second. He was 12 years old. He had a diagnosis of dyslexia, many years of special education and he had many programs to develop phonological processing. Sometimes I've referred to him as Luke uh, in a um, YouTube video, but he really is a student that we 
or that I worked with named Buzz. At the end of sixth grade, Buzz hated reading. Despite improved phonological processing, he still couldn't read text accurately and easily. His mother, his teacher said he can sound out words better, but he still can't read. So as we go through his profile, I want to make sure that you become the diagnostician. Looking at percentiles, they go first percentile to 99th percentile, 50th is right in the middle. Uh, 25th percentile to 75th percentile is what we consider normal range of function. I know some people consider normal range to be as low down, as far down as 16th, and I don't agree with that. I think that you don't want to be thinking, and it's an, it can be disputed, but for us, we want to think that the bottom, absolute bottom end of normal range of functioning is 25th percentile, because if you're functioning at the 16th percentile, you're uh, significantly, probably you have pretty significant weakness. So let's look at his thinking 25th to 75th. And if you look at the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is a receptive vocabulary test, how's Buzz doing? If you're basing it over here, he's at the top end of the normal range. So he should have an easy time learning to read and, and spell and uh, read it in context. His word attack skills, look at that, are the 95th percentile. That's because he's had a lot of reading instruction, developing phonological awareness. But if you look at his word recognition, it's at the 37th percentile. So I'm going to draw those circles right here. And his word attack skills, this one, is well developed. But his word recognition skills over here are only at the 37th percentile. Now if we look at his paragraph reading, this one, uh, that is here, his accuracy and fluency in paragraph reading is the 25th and the 16th percentile. So no wonder he hates to read. He doesn't. He can't read on the page easily. He can sound out words, but if the only thing that he really has strength in is sounding out words, he can't probably sound them out fast enough to read fluently. And so it's frustrating for him. His ability to follow oral directions is the 75th percentile, and this is something that should be interesting to you. His language comprehension is higher, his reading comprehension is much higher than his reading rate, his reading accuracy, or his reading fluency. So Buzz was a student that I knew that if we could develop the underlying sensory cognitive function of symbol imagery, which he did not do well on, then we would be able to, um, we would probably figure that he would be able to um, comprehend easily what he read. So let's look at concept imagery, and that's an image gestalt for comprehension and critical thinking. It's the ability to create an imaged whole for, uh, for oral and written language. So if it's, or I have a slide for this, but if it's oral language or written language coming in, it is the ability to take that and create an, an imaged gestalt from it, uh, such as this, uh, to give you an example. This is from To Kill a Mockingbird. And see if you can visualize this when I read it to you or when you read it. Boo was our neighbor, and if you've read the book or seen the movie, you have an image of Boo. Boo was our neighbor. He gave us two soap dolls, a broken watch and chain, and a pair of good luck pennies and our lives. And so in order to have that embedded in your, or be able to process that, you probably were imaging those two soap dolls you probably actually visualize the tree that he put them in. If you've seen the movie or read the book, The Broken Watch and Chain, A Pair of Good Luck Pennies, you can see all of that in your concept imagery ability. However, there are a lot of students who cannot, and for those students, the language goes in one ear and out the other, and they primarily grasp parts, random details and facts, and that's because they are unable or they have weakness, concept imagery. So imagery, just to finish it up, imagery is the sensory information that prevents language from going in one ear and out the other and enables it to come up here as a, a, an imaged whole. And when you can image that, 
you can get beyond facts, remembering facts, and you can then begin to do what people call higher order thinking skills of main idea, draw conclusions, predict, etc. And I like to think of those as not only higher order thinking skills, but the ability to think logically and to reason. So important. So let's take a look at Sophie. That's Sophie. This is her um, learning profile from the evaluation that we did. She was almost 12 in seventh grade, obviously had never been retained. Though Sophie had easily learned to read words in her early grades by fourth grade, she was sick before going to school and they were moving her to the front of the classroom, which didn't help her performance. So let's now be the diagnosticians again. Here's her vocabulary. How's that? Plus or minus? Good. How's her word attack skills? How are they? Plus or minus? Good. So let's draw our circles up here and once again diagnose it. We'll make this one word attack, this one word recognition, and this one paragraph reading. This is obviously the greater circle is comprehension. So our word attack skills are good. Her word recognition skills are good. And let's drop down here to paragraph reading. Good, 95th percentile. But let's look at her comprehension skills. Look at this. Her ability, even though these were all well developed, her ability to comprehend language was at the second percentile. Obviously, you can see by now that that's an area of weakness for her and her ability to follow oral directions. That was at the 37th percentile. So again, by looking at her learning profile with that learning ability evalu evaluation, we can see what areas we need to focus on. And putting her at the front of the room isn't going to help. We have to fix the underlying sensory cognitive processing that she needs. So before I move on to um, the rest of what we're doing at the Learning Center in terms of instruction, this is so important to me uh, that I want to touch on a little bit more, spend a little bit more time on it. If you have weak concept imagery, you can have weakness in one or all of these. Um, obviously, we've already been talking about language comprehension, both oral and written, but also logical thinking, also following directions, which we've been talking about. But look at these. This is, these are the symptoms that we've seen over the years, expressing language orally and expressing it in writing grasping humor, interpreting social situations where all of that information is coming to you and you're get, grasping parts, this part or that part, but you're not able to put it into a whole, understanding cause and effect, mental mapping. And this is particularly important, that if you have so many of those symptoms, you are very likely to have difficulty responding to a communicating world. And that often can be a... Um, symptom uh, that allows um, a, a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. So if we put this now in, in into a, a hole that you and I can look at, you can see if this is symbol imagery over here, if, if symbol imagery is weak, it's going to result in weak decoding. And if it's really weak, it's likely to result in the label of dyslexia or the symptoms of dyslexia. If concept imagery is weak, then it's going to result in weak comprehension. But the weak comprehension may be something uh, that is not severe enough. The comprehension weakness might not be severe enough to elicit a, a label of autism or hyperlexia, which simply means that you can read words at a level higher than you can comprehend. Um, I think that there are many, many students out there that have weak comprehension skills that um, are much more difficult to diagnose than the students that have difficulty reading words. It 
the student that simply asks questions over and over or seems to veer off into random conversation or doesn't seem to think logically or analytically, those are the students that may not be severe enough to put them into this kind of a label, but they still have weakness that is impacting their ability to uh, perform well in school. So if we're looking at a learning ability evaluation, one of the things we're trying to, to do is identify from kindergarten and all the grades up to 12th grade, we can do this anytime, first grade, second grade, third grade, you can have that evaluation or and when you're an adult or when you're in high school that allows you to know strengths and weaknesses in your learning profile. Identifying those strengths and weaknesses can also, also help you identify the cause of what might be contributing to uh, poor performance or weak performance in school. I, I cannot tell you how many times I have worked with students in high school. I uh, worked with a young man once that tried to commit suicide um, twice. He'd been held back twice. And when I did the diagnostic testing, he had weakness in both symbol imagery and concept imagery. And no one had identified it. what the actual weakness was. They only knew that he was having difficulty with reading and all the it, it, things that they had tried to do did not make a difference for him because they never got far enough back into his sensory processing. So this is what the evaluation looks like. It's um, about four hours of diagnostic testing. These are standardized tests that give us a percentile and an age equivalent and a grade a standard score. And I'm not going to go through all these, but you can see that it's a very comprehensive test. At the end of that test, we have the ability to look at a learning profile and identify those strengths and weaknesses. And maybe the student has only weakness over here in symbol imagery, or maybe the student only has weakness here in concept imagery, or maybe the student has weakness in both, or maybe none. Uh, the uh, evaluation will give us precise information on strengths and weaknesses. Then, something that's probably a little bit different than you've heard before, our ability, our goal is to take a weakness that we've identified and change that weakness to a strength. And that's because we can go far back into the sensory system with our instruction. So here's a little bit of what we do. It's called intensive instruction. I mentioned it already. And that is one to one, four hours a day, five days a week. We usually get years of gain in that intervention because we try to get in as intensively as we can one on one because we have precisely identified what weaknesses, um, what the weaknesses are. And our goal is to change those weaknesses into strengths to help that individual reach his or her learning potential. So if it's somebody like Buzz, I'm going to give you just a little bit of information about what the instruction looks like. We know that symbol imagery is underlying these subsets, those inner circles. So here's what the, in, the instruction looks like. We use very specific language to develop that symbol imagery. What letters do you picture for IP? We're asking Buzz explicitly to, with our language, to visualize those letters. IP, and he says IP. We have Buzz read syllable cards, show the card like that, then take the card away and ask him to tell us what letters he saw. The student images says and writes letter names, air writes and decodes. And very soon we can go from vowel consonant words all the way into multi-syllable words. And what we're doing is we're developing those inner circles, starting with word attack and moving into helping Buzz be able to have the memory to remember sight words. And then we combine those to help Buzz read paragraphs. For example, I think of this, this I think is important for us today, that this is orthographic memory. The student identifies a specific letter, if I take you back to East. What was the second letter you saw? You see that Buzz has nothing in front of him. He's relying solely on his imaging ability. 
after we get those going, we apply it to paragraph reading. If you remember Buzz's profile, do we need to worry about comprehension? No. All we had to do was develop these. And he was a child or is a child that learned to comprehend. And the end of Buzz's story is that he went on to college and graduated. So now we get to concept image. Remember, it's a two-sided coin. This is the opposite. It underlies comprehension, not these. So the language to develop concept imagery is different than the language to develop symbol imagery. What do those words make you picture? And so you read a full sentence or a full paragraph to Sophie. Help me know, this is Nancy talking over here. Help me know what you're picturing. Start at the top and go down. And what I put on this slide, you can see that really Sophie had a lot of difficulty imaging that. So this part of the clown is gray. And I can't tell you how many times I would sit with a, uh, even a college student and say, what are you picturing for a clown? And the college student would say, eh, just a regular old clown. And that was my way of understanding that the imagery was not strong. So I began uh, to use my language to help focus the imagery. And so you start with one word and then expand to small sentences, then longer sentences. So you have sentence by sentence imaging. Imaging. This is the first sentence, this is a second sentence, this is a third sentence. While well, those words make you picture, and as you move from a word to a sentence to sentence by sentence, students begin to um, image the gestalt, not just separate parts. And once that's happening, we can start to apply higher order thinking. From what you pictured, why? It's a prediction or a conclusion question. And so she uses her imagery of the whole to answer a higher order thinking skill question. So to finish up um, <clears throat> on what instruction looks like, our goal is to identify which type of imagery we want to develop and then simply go in there in a rather short period of time and explicitly develop the language or the imagery. Now, the very last thing that I want to talk to you about is that while 31 years ago we may have started in 1986 with just instruction, we've rapidly done a lot of research. And now in 2018, we, somewhere in here, in 2016, I think, we began to get neurological as well as behavioral information on the processes that we were teaching with sensory cognitive functioning. So let me show you a little bit. We participated in this gold standard research. First thing that we learned is that our experience with instruction matched a general theory of cognition called dual coding theory, DCT. And it, when I named my program Visualizing and Verbalizing, that essentially is what dual coding is. It's using the imagery code and the language code as, they, as there's an interplay between them for cognition. And this is this theory. This is Alan Pavio. Cognition is proportional. He's the author um, of, of dual coding theory. It, cognition is proportional. This is all really important. To the extent that the coding mechanisms of mental representations, that's imagery and language, are integrated or there's an interplay, he says performance is mediated by the joint activity of verbal and nonverbal systems. The nonverbal system is imagery. Cognition is always an interplay between those two systems. So if we look at what we have in our learning centers, we have data on more than 40,000 students over all these years. And I want to take just a moment to show you what it looks like. Uh, this is data compiled on just our decoding only students. These are just the buzzes. Um, we can see that in this in this data, we have 2,601 students, and the average hour of instructions in symbol, instruction in symbol imagery was 103. These are standard score changes, and the purple indicates a large standard score chain, change in only 103 hours. And that's for word attack, word recognition, accuracy, and comprehension. Those are astoundingly good changes in uh, a relatively short period of time. And if we look at that in, in percentiles, same 
uh, same students. It's sometimes easier to see it in percentiles. Starting at the 14th percentile, those students on the average went to the 47th percentile. 25th to 47th, 7th to, to 19th in accuracy, and 32nd to 53rd in comprehension. Very exciting gains in a relatively short period of time, 103, week, 103 uh, hours. Comprehension only students uh, is, is equally exciting to me. There's 4,000 students in, in this database that we're looking at, less than 100 hours of instruction. And in comprehension, the standard score gains are huge. They're, they're medium gains in vocabulary, but they're huge um, in comprehension. And part of that, if you look over here in percentiles, their uh, beginning, their initial score in, the per in percentiles was higher than in following oral directions and comprehension. But look at this. Um, the mean went from the 23rd percentile to the 45th in comprehension and the 13th to the 30th in oral directions. But this is the most exciting slide, and I had to put it in. These are the students that had some really severe comprehension uh, difficulty. And I'll just take you over here. You can see that their comprehension Standard score change was huge, but look at this. These are students that start at the 8th percentile and after 102 hours of instruction went to the 47th percentile. And that's absolutely life-changing. And I'm very proud of it. I want to tell you another thing that's exciting, that this is very recent. <clears throat> An eight-week study with dyslexic children resulted in reading improvement, but also changes in the underlying deficit in the brain. And this is from Dr. Jason Yates. Nate Men in CHDD Outlook 2017, he says, one thing I can say def definitively is that the intensive reading intervention program changes the underlying structure of the brain, and that's something we are clearly seeing. That was only eight weeks with dyslexic children. And I would like for you to see a quick video on a student whose life was changed that had been diagnosed with dyslexia. My daughter Tallulah is seven years old and we're in Australia. Tallulah is a fantastic kid. She has always been so bright and funny and interested in people and conversation. Her um, verbal uh, capacity has always been huge. She's a great kid to, um, to bring up. I guess because she was very verbal from being very, when she was very young, we just assumed that she would be fantastic at school. The grade one teacher at the time uh, called me. I said to her, oh, you know, I'm having some troubles taking Tallulah to school. She was crying at, in the morning at school. I just said to the teacher, you're going to have to work out what's going on. You know, you have to help me work out what's going on. And she rang me a few days later and she said, um, I've done some tests on Tallulah. I think she might have dyslexia. That's why my bright, competent, social, confident, amazingly gifted in terms of her vocabulary child can't read. Our educational psychologist recommended Linda Mood Bell and when I first heard about it I have to say I was very skeptical. <laughs> when I heard about the intensity of the, the contact I was very reluctant. I was like no that's not going to work for me, I'm working, my husband's working, we just can't manage that, it's too much of an interruption on our, on our family life and it would be too much on her was what I was primarily concerned about. But as I looked into it more and read the research articles and spent time on the internet and I actually got to speak to a family that was going through Linda Mood Bell themselves and they absolutely raved about it. And that's what I wanted. I wanted um, a first-hand experience of it. I wanted to know that it worked for real people like myself and my family. And so I thought, let's invest this time and money in, in an intensive way 
and, and take a gamble and see if it works. And if it does work, it'll bridge the gap from where we are now to where we want to be in terms of her reading. And hopefully the rest will just take care of itself. And that's what happened. She just ran up the stairs, skipped in, so happy to be here, looked at me with a big smile on her face and said, see ya, I'll see you tonight. And I just thought, oh, this is gonna be great. This is gonna be really good. So Seeing Stars is about, I guess it's about showing children how to visualise in their head words and what they look like and then what they sound like. So words and sounds and combinations of sounds, that's, that's my understanding of Seeing Stars. I distinctly remember coming in for my first consultation on the Friday. So she started on the Monday and everything was fine and every time we picked her up she was great, she was fine. She was a little bit tired but nothing overwhelming so that, that tension was eased from our point of view and we were confident that, that she was enjoying herself and we waited to see what would happen in that first, um, that first Friday consultation. So I went in and I watched her um, work with the teacher for the first time and uh, I, <laughs> it's so emo it's, it's still emotional now because I remember, um, I distinctly remember sitting there thinking, my daughter couldn't read on Monday and now she can read. <laughs> it was just, sorry. <laughs> I was so proud of her and I was so pleased that we had made the sacrifice that we had made and so relieved that it turned out to be the right choice. Five days, yep. She took a final assessment and the results were just incredible, just more than what I had hoped for. She was reading at age level, uh, which was just you know, just something that we just never thought was possible given the, the experience that we'd had the year before and for the half a year of school that we had before we started Linda Mood Bell. And that gap that I was talking about earlier has really been jumped and when we did the um, assessment we showed our individual needs teacher at the school that Tallulah is at and she said looking at Tallulah now in terms of her comprehension and her reading ability, I wouldn't even see a dyslexic profile. So yeah, it's just been, she said to me, whatever you did last, last year, whatever intervention you did last year has just really stood her in great stead to be at the point that she is now and we can just move forward. Doing Linda Mood Bell has changed our life. It's changed our family's life. These are the research collaborators with all the research that we've done. I believe passionately, and this is the end. If you made it this far, good on you, as they say in Australia. We believe passionately that children and adults can be taught to read and comprehend to their potential. I mean passionately, including those individuals previously diagnosed with dyslexia, hyperlexia, and or an autism spectrum disorder. Independence is our goal. And we want to help those students by getting at their sensory input. Sensory input. We can help them self-correct. And when they can self-correct, they can monitor. And they can monitor because of that sensory input from imagery. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about Learning Centers today and what we do. And I hope that we'll see you soon. Thanks.